We've been talking about how sometimes God changes our plans. Uh, last week we were looking, we were looking at um, how sometimes uh, God puts us in places where we are, are ashamed or, or, or people look down on us, um, such as was the case for Mary. Um, and actually Mary's family, too, it kind of buckled out to them. Uh, and of course, sometimes we, uh, sometimes we shame ourselves by our own decisions. <laughs> and uh, for that, you know, God can get you through it. But uh, this week, we're going to continue talking about how, uh, how God sometimes changes our plans in a way that we might not like. And uh, I think that this song by Lauren Story uh, really kind of uh, is a good introduction to what we're trying to look at. Um, what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? What if trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? See, oftentimes we pray for things, and we want to get to know God in a deeper way. But then the way that he chooses in order for that to happen, we're just not really on board with that. <laughs> I, uh, I was reading a book called The Bait of Satan by John Bevere. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but um, he was actually talking about, about this too. And, uh, you know, after being here in, in Tularosa in ministry for a while, yeah, I, I've been in ministry for a long time. I've been in ministry since, uh, official ministry since I was 13, but before that too. So I've been in ministry for like, I don't know, 15 years or something. And once you've been in ministry a while, like, you know, a day or two, things don't really go how you planned. And, uh, you know, after moving here in Tularosa for a bit, I had some words with God. I said, you know, God, this is awful and fair that I should do what's right and get mistreated for it. It's supposed to be easier. This is how it's supposed to go, God, because evidently our, our wires got crossed. So let me kind of just spell things out here because I, I feel like we're not on the same. Uh, I do what's right, and then everything works out for me. And nobody opposes me in doing the right thing, and it, it, all my dream, wildest dreams come true. It's like voting for Pedro. And that's not how it turns out. And uh, so much, and sometimes you face so much meanness and pain in life that uh, you kind of start to feel like things are pointless and hopeless. Uh, maybe it's our fault, maybe it's somebody else's fault. I, I'm not trying to say whose fault it is, but sometimes it's draining to just keep doing what's right. You think, if I would have done what I wanted to do in the first place, I wouldn't have to be putting up with all this crap, you know? <laughs> and uh, for a lot of times, it, sometimes it e is easier to, to go off and do your own thing. And uh, in Jeremiah 29, 11, uh, Israel was going through a similar difficult time. Uh, let me just kind of set, set up the story here. Um, Israel, this, this nation here that God has called to live there, they're, they're all happy and everything, right? And they decide that they don't have to follow God's laws. Um, they don't have to do things the way that God tells them to do it. They can just do whatever they want. And so God says, okay, you, you really need to knock that off. And so then hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later, because they're just not listening, and he keeps waiting and being patient, but they still won't listen. So hundreds of years later, he brings another nation by called Babylon. And uh, Babylon was a world empire of the time. And uh, so they come in, and, and they take over their nation, and they exile them. And uh, so bad things happen there. And this prophet is writing to them after they've been exiled. And, uh, and he has some things to say that, that are very, uh, very much so exactly what we're talking about. For this is what the Lord says, When 70 years uh, for Babylon are complete, I will attend to you and will confirm my promise concerning you to restore you to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you. This is the Lord's declaration's plan for your welfare, um, I'm sorry, well-being and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. You will call to me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. Now, remember, remember this in context. They've just been exiled from their home. They've watched their kids being murdered in front of them. They've watched all their belongings be stripped away. They don't have a culture left. Babylon is training them in how to speak their language so that they don't, don't even have their own language anymore. There is nothing anymore that makes them a people. And uh, so imagine you're hearing this from God after all that's happened, it almost sounds like irony, is what it, it, it almost. You will call to me and, and, uh, and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. I, you will seek me and find me when, I'm sorry, when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you. This is the Lord's declaration. I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations, 
and places where I banished you. This is the Lord's declaration. He said that like three or four times so far. Now, I will restore you to the place from which I deported you. And that's the second time he said that. And uh, so here we have God saying, okay, so you guys are doing your own things, and I have changed your plans, but it's okay because I still have a bigger plan. God, how could this, how could this terrible mess have any of your workings in it? You know, like, for instance, look in the story of Joseph in Genesis. God tells him, hey, I'm going to make you rule, I'm going to make you a ruler over, over all, your, all your family. You're going to be, like, the number one, the number one. And uh, so then he gets sold into slavery, accused of things that he didn't do, and, uh, you know, all this bad stuff happens. And I, I bet you somewhere in there he thought, you know, <laughs> this isn't really, you know, what's going on here. And, and a lot of times that, that happens to us. So, you know, Israel lives in sin. They want to do what they were, what they want. They, 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 they always disobey God. And now after hundreds of years, punishment is coming from God to them. And these are the three ways that Israel has responded so far. Okay, with li they're living in sin. This is what they've done. First off, they denied it. If you read through the book of Jeremiah, it, it kind of highlights a lot of the things that they were saying. And it says it a little bit in the books of Kings, but mostly in, in Jeremiah it really has a good grasp of this. We are God's people. We will never be conquered. <laughs> Don't you talk bad about Jerusalem. In fact, they were beating up prophets and killing the prophets and throwing the prophets in prison because they were trying to tell them, hey, if you don't turn from your sin, God's going to just, you know, things aren't going to go well for Jerusalem. And uh, they don't want to listen because, hey, don't you talk bad about, about Jerusalem. We don't want to live for God. We don't want to honor God. But don't you dare tell us what we're doing is wrong. And, uh, you know, things really haven't changed. Uh, we can live however we want without consequences. They were even getting to the point of worshiping other gods. In fact, they were getting to the point of erecting idols in the house of God. I mean, I don't know if you know anything about the Bible, but this is just a big no-no. Like, he says it a hundred times in there. You know, hey, don't be worshiping idols. You know, I, I've called you to a different purpose. This is not what I want you to be doing. And, and, and here they are doing it anyways. And another, another mindset that they start going into is fatalism. Fatalism basically means that something is doomed to happen. It's, it's fated to happen. Does that kind of make sense? Uh, I know fatalism isn't a word that you might hear a whole lot, but um, see, in ancient times, a god... Well, I'll come back to that. Israel had experienced God when he had brought them from slavery out of Egypt... And, uh, you know, he had done this big showy thing, brought them to this mountain, given them, you know, this, this, uh, this law from God himself, took them to this new land. I mean, things were going great. But you have kind of this idea of God doesn't do the big stuff anymore now. See, he did the big stuff back then when he was drawing us out of Egypt. But now he, God doesn't do those big things anymore. And... Uh, you, you see some of this is when what they say throughout, once again, in, Je in Jeremiah. There's nothing we can do. We're doomed. And not only are we doom doomed, but it's our parents' fault. In the book of Ezekiel, it talks about this too. And he's saying, no, 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 no. Stop saying it's your parents' fault. <laughs> it's your fault. <laughs> and uh, you can read that in Ezekiel for yourself. But they kind of add this idea that it doesn't matter what we do because whatever's going to happen is going to happen. At this point, why turn from our sins? It's not going to change anything. You know, and, and uh, so they just have this kind of deflection. Once again, we, we kind of see that happening a lot. And then the third thing that this, this whole living in sin thing did with, their, with them is it caused a lot of doubt where they weren't putting their faith in God, and it caused a lot of confusion where they weren't, they weren't really sure of God and, and what he was saying. Um, if, uh, the, name, the, the might of a God in ancient times was shown by victory in battle. Now, this does sounds kind of strange, but in the ancient world, this was kind of a big deal. If your god was real and, and strong, you'd win a war. And if he wasn't or the other god was stronger, you'd lose the war. And so there was this constant like tug of war going on between the different gods of the ancient world. You know, you got, you got you know, Babylon's god fighting Assyria's god. And you, you see this going down throughout history. And, you know, you, you see the kings in their, in their records and in their annals when they're bragging about different stuff. 
Uh, you know, my God proved himself mighty over that, and, you know, he gave us this victory and stuff. And, and, and then you get to here, and it kind of looks like, the, like God isn't strong enough to stand up to Babylon. And you have this kind of, they're a little bit unsure of, of their faith in God now because they've lost the battle. And that's not supposed to happen because God's all-powerful, therefore we should always win, right? And so there's this kind of uh, confusion because they've been living in, so long, living in sin for so long, they don't understand that God is handing them over to punishment. See what I mean? They, they thought they could just do whatever they wanted, and they kept doing whatever they wanted. And even though God told them a hundred times, you can't do whatever you want, they didn't want to listen. And then when the results of living how they wanted came about, it was like, oh, well, mm, no, that means that God's not strong enough. See, Judah falling to Babylon, <laughs> it didn't mean that God wasn't strong enough, but that's how they saw it. And another thing that, that they must have felt with this, I, and I'm, this one's not in the Bible, this is just my own speculation, maybe God hates us, because that's how we think sometimes. You know what I mean? We pray for something, it doesn't ha happen how we want, or maybe we're just going through life and something bad happens. And uh, oftentimes we just kind of get to this idea of God hates us or he just doesn't really care. Or maybe he loves Babylon more than he loves us. Maybe he isn't so good as we thought. You know, we're better than Babylon. We're better than them, and yet they're beating us. You know, and you see a lot of this confusion. If you read through the prophets, you'll, you'll kind of get the grasp of what I'm talking about. Um, actually, in, in I, had, uh, I had a college friend uh, that, check this out, she got cancer and died before I ever even found out that she had gotten cancer. That's how rapid the cancer was. And uh, this was just, just last month that she died, and I just found out about it yesterday. And uh, wow, I mean, so I mean, that, that's kind of the doubt, the, the confusion that I'm talking about. Why didn't God hear our prayers? Why didn't he do something about this? You know, why, is he not strong enough? Can he not do this? And uh, with this friend, um, she actually uh, left behind five um, kids. All of them are um, under 18. And one of the things that one of the daughters said was she said, I'm mad at God because he didn't answer. And sometimes in life, God has this way of, of changing our plans. We know what we're doing. And then God changes our plans, and, and we're not ready for the change. And this is exactly how Judah felt. Now, Judah brought it on themselves, absolutely. I'm not trying to justify them, but... At the same time, they were, they were completely flabbergasted by the idea that they could lose and get kicked out of their home that God gave them. Hey, God gave us this piece of dirt. You can't kick us out of it. And then they did. So it's like, what's going on here? And uh, although God was changing their plans, it wasn't hopeless. And that's the idea of what we just read in Jeremiah. Yeah, I'm changing your plans. You know, I... I I've got something else going on, but check this out. I have my own plans, and they're actually for your future. They're actually for your hope. I'm doing this painful thing now, this thing that you don't want to happen, but in my changing your plans, I'm bringing something better. And see, that's hard for us to understand because we think, now hold on, Judah was already in the promised land what could you possibly make better by t kicking them out of the promised land only to bring them back later? See what I mean? Like, it, it just doesn't really make sense to us. But, see, here's, here's the interesting thing. God brought defeat and struggle to Judah because they refused to obey him. But here was the result. When Israel was brought back to their home, they never worshipped other gods again. As a, as, a, as a whole, I, I mean, I, don't, I can't attest for every single Israelite. <laughs> I can't do it, but I mean, as a whole, idol worship completely disappeared from Israel's record to the point that they were so scared of breaking the law that when Jesus came, they had a group called the Pharisees who their whole purpose was to make sure that the law was not violated at all. 
So you can see how, you know, this, <laughs> this was a big event for Israel. Completely changed how they saw things. And, uh, you know, God doesn't enjoy punishing the wicked. He waits and he waits and he waits. But when we don't listen, there are consequences. And sometimes, you know, God changes our plans. And, 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 re- and <sighs> it's hard. But when God changes our plans, he does it so we reach who we wouldn't and so that we do what we wouldn't. See what I mean? Naturally in life, we're going to gravitate to the things that are most comfortable. And in life, you're going to find yourself either constantly challenging yourself or constantly gratifying yourself. And God has a way of shaking us from that place of constantly gratifying ourselves where he skyrockets us into a place of continually challenging ourselves. Because if it wasn't for that, you know, we would live our lives for ourselves all the time and never think of anybody else. You know, for instance, okay, so people get cancer. Well, that, that's sad but they're over there. Then you get cancer, and it's like, well, this is a little bit closer to home. Then your kids get cancer, and it's like, oh, this is a little bit closer to home. See what I mean? It, sometimes when God does, it, does things, it helps us to see what other people have been going through the whole time that we've just been blind to. It's easy to say, hey, this is how, this is how you get off of drugs. This is what you do when your kids aren't saved. This is, how you, this is what you do when, but when it's you, it's a little bit different. See what I mean? And uh, when, you're, when you're teaching somebody something from experience, it means a lot more than when you're just simply saying all the things that you know. You know, if God wanted, it, uh, wanted us all to be college kids, <laughs> then, well, then none of us would go through any bad problems. Um, so, okay, God changes our plans so that we reach people we wouldn't, so that we do things that we wouldn't, but also sometimes he does it there. Sometimes God changes our plans <laughs> so that we'll change how we live. Because, you know, we just kind of accept um, what's around us. You know, as kids, for instance, kids have an, a, an amazing ability to adapt to uh, the situation that they've been born into. And we kind of have a habit of repeating behavior that we've seen. I'm sure you guys can, can relate to this. Um, we typically tend to do the sa- show the same attitudes that our parents showed, regardless of whether we do the same things. We typically show the same attitudes, um, those kinds of things. And unless something drastic happens in our lives, we kind of uh, do the same thing indefinitely. You know what I mean? But when God cha- causes a big drastic change in our lives, oftentimes he does it so that we'll change how we live. You know what I mean? Like, for instance, when, when I was a kid... You know, I I knew about God, but then a series of unfortunate events happened, <laughs> and I learned to know Him for myself. That wouldn't have happened if God wouldn't have brought those unfortunate events by. See what I mean? God has a way of 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 bringing things by that change how we live. Hey, I don't see why this is hurting anybody, and then we see, and it's like, oh, maybe I shouldn't do that anymore. You know, when, when we're a kid, for instance, we can throw temper tantrums and our and you know well, we just throw temper tantrums. But then you get married and you have kids and you start throwing temper tantrums and you start seeing how it affects your kids and then they start doing the same thing and it's like, oh, I don't like that. I don't like this little attitude that you're getting from. It must have been your mother. You know, it's like, well, no, actually, I got it from you. Oh, well, I don't like that. So sometimes God changes our plans so we change how we live. Okay, let's, let's wrap some stuff up here. Every struggle is not caused by God. Did you know that? Not every struggle in life is caused by God. I see people go through bad times, eh, bad things, and they say, well, you know, God must have known that I needed it. Here's the thing. Not every struggle that you go through is from God. He's not, like, chasing you down, trying, trying to smother you as hard as he can. However, sometimes they are, and with that being said, God can give life's chaos meaning. Does that kind of make sense? Not everything happens for a reason, but God can give meaning to anything. That's entirely different. That's entirely different. See, because if everything happens for a reason, then that would mean that God preordained Adam and Eve to fall out of the garden. He preordained them to sin. He preordained for, for your loved ones to, to, to you know, ha- all these bad things and, and for, for your kids to get into drugs. And he, he, you see what I mean? No, he didn't preordain those things. But 
God has a way of taking those chaotic things and giving them meaning. And, and that, that is important because basically what God does is he builds and nothing that anybody or anything do, uh, does can ever take you out of God's will except for yourself. And then, as he's building, sometimes things happen that make it seem like whatever he was building is completely demolished. Then he takes the ashes and he builds some more. And with God, there's no such thing as a hopeless situation. And I that, but God can make every struggle an appointment. Now, what do I mean by that? When I go through something and then... Out of nowhere, wouldn't you know it, I run into somebody else who's going through that same thing, and I'm able to connect with them. See what I mean? We had a woman in, in here that was actually giving us a testimony. Uh, it was last year sometime. And she talked about how she got cancer again and how she, it, was, it opened a door for her to reach people um, that uh, weren't receptive to the gospel, but then they got cancer, and she had cancer, so they had a point of connection there. See what I mean? Now, that might sound like, well, what's the good of that? I mean, but here, remember this. We all, we're all going to die. But we can have meaning in our death. We can have meaning in our life. See what I mean? And uh, so uh, nothing, and, and that little quote I just said is actually from that book that I mentioned earlier, Bait of Satan. No one and nothing can get you out of the will of God, only you. God is always working, even in times of punishment. You keep praying, you keep serving people, you keep loving your neighbor, you keep, you keep desiring for more of God, and, and you just trust that God is working. That's just, I, don't, I can't explain how that works, but, I mean, it does. God is always working, even in times of punishment. Now, how you respond, and I really want you to get this, how you respond is oftentimes more important than what you're going through. What we think is, get me out of this terrible situation right now, but the truth is, God's building character in us that, that does, isn't just going to appear in us one day. Do you know what I mean? We all want to be these, you know, strong, these strong people of the faith that, that impact the world. Well, we can't impact people if nothing ever happens to us. And it, you can't make a decision in a vacuum. It's just impossible. God allows these different things, and then he uses the different things. And how you respond is really, really of utmost importance. This is how we become an encouraging person. This is how we become able to relate to somebody else's pain, is when we respond well in a bad situation, when somebody does us wrong and we do what's right, when bad situations come by and we handle it correctly. Now, God can use anything. If you're going through a hard time, it, it, whether it's your fault or not, it, it doesn't matter. God hasn't abandoned you. God hasn't abandoned you. He, he, he can use anything. Now, now that I've said that, though, I, I do feel obligated to say this. Sometimes God will, for lack of a better word, reject us while we're in sin. Now, hold on. What, what do you mean reject us? Let, let me explain. Does God abandon us? No. Okay. It's kind of hard to trip over semantics here. But, for instance, if you don't forgive someone, will God forgive you? No. If you are mistreating your spouse, will God answer your prayers? No. These are things that the Bible says. If we are living immorally, will God just let us live in sin? No. See, I mean, God doesn't abandon us, but he will reject us when we're living in sin. And re reject is really a, a bad word. I can't think of a better word, though. Uh, resist, maybe, is a better word. Um, God will just kind of put up a wall, if you kind of get what I'm saying, where basically, here, let me reword it. This is a better way to reword it. God isn't a sugar daddy. We don't go and do whatever we want, and then, daddy God, daddy God, give me whatever I want, and then he gives us our house and our car and our wealth, and then we go on our, and live our way, and then we come back, oh, daddy God, daddy God. No, God is not a sugar daddy, and that's what I'm getting at. There comes a point when when God, although he doesn't abandon us, will sometimes withdraw. See what I mean? He'll sometimes pull back on the reins a little bit. Give us time to be tested. Give us time to grow. Give us time to decide. See what I mean? Give us time to, to work through things and to seek him. I know that sounds a little bit complicated, but well, maybe it is complicated. 
And so I hope that you're seeing, and, and what we've talked about, when God changes our plans, it, it goes from a me focus to a you focus. See, at the beginning of, of what we've been talking about, it was all about, look at what I'm going through, look at what I'm going through. But now, if you notice, things are starting to change. Now, we're seeing how when God changes our plans, it, it slowly and, and subtly switches from all about me to now you. See what I mean? And when we start living our lives not just for ourselves, there's a certain amount of, of joy and, and purpose and focus that comes into your life that you, you just don't get before that. It may be uncomfortable, but when God changes our plans, we become able to relate to, uh, to others in pain. We're able to relate to people who are in pain. And, um, you know, that's, that's not nothing. That, that's kind of a big deal. So we're going to close out there. And uh, if